I want to welcome you here tonight to the JFAN annual meeting. Bigger is not better. Rural communities in the wake of livestock consolidation. My name is Diane Rosenberg, and I'm the executive director of Jefferson County Farmers and Neighbors, JFAN. We have an incredible all-star panel of speakers with us tonight. Art Cullen, Dr. Chris Jones, Chris Peterson, and Sonia Ayers. Each will talk about what they've seen and experienced in rural communities as a result of livestock consolidation in rural Iowa. For those of you who are new to JFAN, we're a 501c3 community organization dedicated to protecting the quality of life of Jefferson County residents from CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations, also called factory farms. We've been at this for 18 years, and we work on the local level, as well as on the state and national levels to protect Jefferson County and Iowa from the harms caused by CAFOs. JFIN is not anti-farming. We support traditional independent livestock production that's responsible, respectful, and regenerative. You can learn more about JFIN and the success that we've had here in Jefferson County at jfiniowa.org. So I'm gonna make just a few brief announcements before we begin. As many of you know, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources is conducting a review of chapter 65 of the Iowa Administrative Code, which governs CAFOs. For the last year and a half, JFAN has worked with a number of environmental groups to recommend improvements to these rules, to, and these rules and regulations during three separate preliminary public hearing, uh, public comment periods. Um, many of many of um, you have participated in those. At the beginning of 2024, there's going to be one more round of public comments, and this will be the formal and final public comment period that will determine the rules that will be adopted. So JFIN will once again closely review this updated version of Chapter 65 and make our recommendations. And I want to encourage everyone to watch for our action alerts and participate in this final comment period. This is our last chance to make as strong a case as possible for regulations that better protect people and our waterways. Second, as the Farm Bill is currently being negotiated in Congress, there's a dangerous marker bill that may be included that has the potential to impact every one of us. It's called the EATS Act, Ending Agricultural Trade Suppression Act, and it was developed in response to Proposition 12. The House version was introduced by Iowa Representative Ashley Henson, and every one of Iowa's congressional legislators are co-sponsors of either the House or Senate version. Now the EATS Act would nullify any state laws on agricultural products sold across state lines. A Harvard Law School study found that it could, could nullify about 1,100 laws that affect public health, farmer and crop safety, food quality, and animal welfare, among other things. With the EATS Act, the weakest laws in the nation would govern our agricultural system and the food that we eat. Now, JFAN is a member of the Defeat Eats Coalition, and that's a group of over 100 national and community and state organizations around the country that oppose the bill. I encourage you to learn more about the bill at defeateats.com, sign the petition and watch for action alerts on how you can help stop this destructive bill. You can also learn more about the EATS Act on the JFAN website at jfaniowa.org. Finally, there's an investor in Jefferson County that looks into purchasing farmland up for sale to keep it in crops in order to protect it from CAFO development. If you have land you're planning to sell, or if you know of any for sale, you can contact me, Diane Rosenberg, at jfan at lisco.com. That's L-I-S-C-O dot com. And we'll help connect you with this investor. So that's that concludes my announcements. And I want to start off by acknowledging some of our corporate sponsors. These are the companies and organizations that support the work that JFAN does and they help make tonight's meeting possible. The first is our platinum corporate sponsor, the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust. SILT is a terrific organization that works to preserve farmland for sustainable and healthy food production. 
I also want to acknowledge our two gold sponsors, Air on Lifestyle Technology and Radiance Dairy, two successful businesses in the Fairfield community. Thank you all very much for your support tonight. So we're gonna start with our panelists making presentations and then we're gonna go right into your questions after that. If you have questions for our speakers, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat, so we can see them. And you can also, if you want to ask a question anonymously, there's an option for you to do that as well. So now I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker, Art Cullen. Art is the editor and co-owner of the Storm Lake Times up in Buena Vista County in Northwest Iowa. He's been a journalist for about 40 years. He's got his finger on the pulse of Iowa and he's won the Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in 2017 for a series of editorials he did on the dark money that funded the defense of three counties sued by the Des Moines Waterworks um, for polluting the Raccoon River, which is where they get their water. Art has written a book, Storm Lake, a chronicle of change, resilience, and hope from the Heartland, from a Heartland newspaper. And just this week, he published an editorial in his paper entitled, Something is Amiss in Iowa, where he wrote, quote, consolidation is killing us. On that note, I'll turn it over to you, Art. I wanna welcome you and thank you for being with us here tonight. Well, thank you, Diane. And, uh... Glad you're reading my column. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I guess my uh, my assignment for this evening was to talk about the impacts of of consolidation uh, from the perspective of Storm Lake, and so I we kind of start uh, uh, really, you know, going on fifty years ago uh, in the late nineteen seventies, we started to see uh, that. Uh, the pork industry was adopting, they were, they were learning from the poultry industry and, and realized that they could process hogs more efficiently if they raised them indoors. Uh, and it was more convenient for the packers if you raise a hog of uniform size uh, uh, with, uh, you know, low fat content, similar body structures, et cetera. At the same time, the old uh, meat packing company high grade uh, was faced with a strike from the amalgamated meat cutters now the united food and commercial workers union uh, and they were seeking a pretty significant pay hike from high grade which was based in detroit and at that time was one of the big four packers i think and uh, uh, by the way there's been a meat packing presence in storm lake since 1920 and uh, so in 1980, uh, there was a, there was going to be a strike. High grade closed down the plant in Storm Lake, kept it closed long enough to bust the union. And then it reopened as an IBP plant uh, about a year later. And, uh, and that's really when the era of consolidation began in Storm Lake. Uh, and we were already seeing hogs moving indoors. Uh, uh, poultry had moved into year-round production. It, previously, turkeys had been raised on pasture. This is also a major turkey processing uh, community. And uh, so it really started about 1980 when IBP took over the plant, brought in a lot of uh, refugees from, from uh, Laos, from the Vietnam War, uh they were Taidam refugees and uh, uh there's about 300 moved in and at the same time the the farm crisis was going on and there were uh the uh the young guys that used to work in the packing plants at night while working on a farm during the day were all being driven out of agriculture and um, so they were fleeing for texas or oklahoma or wherever they could find a decent job and the, these part-time uh, night shift jobs on cleanup crews and so on weren't available. You know, the, the, these guys weren't available. They were gone. And so uh, Southeast Asians came in and took those positions. This is a non-union plant. Uh, line speeds went up. Pay went was half of what it, uh, what it was under high grade, under the union contract. Uh, they went from 12 bucks an hour to 6 bucks an hour. 
uh, back then. And uh, uh, it, it really changed uh, Storm Lake dramatically. And uh, it's not the fault of the Asians. Uh, they were just looking for a safe place to land. And uh, uh, they worked like beavers and uh, enculturated themselves in the community. But uh, all the Union folks had left Storm Lake. And, uh, and then there weren't enough Asians to populate the plant. At one time, there were 500 uh, people working at this high-grade meat pork processing plant. Today, there's 3,000. Uh, and uh, so that that tells you there's a mixed bag in Storm Lake, although it's, it's added greatly to Storm Lake's uh, commercial vitality. And there's a lot more people here. There's a lot more action in Storm Lake. It's a much, much more interesting and welcoming community than it ever was before. About 30 languages are spoken here the school enrollment's growing. But all during this period, uh, you know, they ran out of Asians. And so they had to go to Mexico and get Mexicans to come in and take the jobs because there just weren't any Anglos left in the workforce, frankly. And certainly not that wanted to work uh, at half the what the union wages were. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, all the white people were gone. And... Uh, and it became pretty much an immigrant workforce. And uh, well, like I say, that has uh, has remade Storm Lake in a lot of beautiful ways uh, that are that are hard for outsiders to understand. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, what it did is it eliminated it, the independent pork producer. Uh, you know, the, the last sow producer in Buena, Buena Vista County was probably 1998 uh, was when they went out, when they uh, when they drove sow prices down. And, you know, these are all coincidental events, you know, uh, high grade closing down the uh, IBP busting the union, uh, demanding lean uniform hogs. Uh, you know, all this is happening in the middle of the farm crisis when Wall Street sees a perfect opportunity to knock out independent livestock producers uh, and really kind of take a stranglehold on the market. And that's exactly what what happened between 1980 and the year 2000. There was a 20 year period there where the pork industry was just completely consolidated. And, you know, uh, it doesn't take any expert to tell you what's happened to Iowa over that period. Uh, and certainly Chris Jones and Chris Peterson and Sonia Ayers can talk with a lot more expertise than I can. But just drive around and your nose will tell you. And uh, I can also say that, I, you know, in 1975, uh, St. Mary's High School, where I graduated, my senior class was 44 students. You know, now it's nine students at St. Mary's because back then these these families didn't need vouchers for private schools. Uh, they, they were union meatpacking households uh, that, you know, paid cash and sent their kids to college. And uh, that's that's entirely changed. And and uh, so there's been a lot of good and a lot of bad that's come from consolidation. The good is, is that it opened our eyes to other cultures and storm like is a much uh, a much more diverse place there's a high rate of new business openings uh, main streets full uh, but on the other hand uh, uh, you know we we've, we've uh, polluted the raccoon river with both commercial fertilizer and manure uh, like chris jones points out wearing a suspenders with your belt uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we've got these huge sow facilities uh, operated by Iowa Select that, you know, just uh, they're, they're pumping manure a mile up the road and, and applying it. And it's just reeks, you know, it's just putrid. And and most important, the independent pork producer has disappeared. Uh, I mean, when I went to again, growing up. Everybody uh, that got off the bus from early, early Iowa, a little town 12 miles south of Storm Lake, you could smell them coming in. You know, they just they just gotten done with chores in the hog house. And, 
you know, and they were all, uh, that's how they were paying for their college eventually was raising hogs and selling them. And those guys are all gone. And, you know, Chris Peterson is, is still hanging in there. I don't know how, uh, but, but that's, what's really changed. And those guys were all buying new pickups every other year. And, uh, you know, now that those car dealers are gone and, uh, so storm Lake is poorer in a lot of ways, uh, than it used to be. Our meat packing wage is half what it was in real terms. Uh, Iowa's, or excuse me, Storm Lake's median household income is about $50,000. Iowa's median household income is about $80,000. Minnesota's is $96,000. Illinois is ninety five. dollars So it tells you where Storm Lake lands in comparison to the rest of the Midwest and where Iowa lands in comparison to the rest of the Midwest. Uh, you know, we're sucking hind tit, to use a farm term. And uh, and the results are, you know, the results are in. We've got the highest uh, childhood rate of asthma in the country. Uh, we've got the only state with a growing incidence of cancer. Uh, we are number two in cancer incidence just behind Kentucky, the tobacco capital of America. And you have to wonder, uh, where did all that uh, come from? And uh also it all coincides with huge land use changes that have occurred since 1980 that have led to uh the pollution of the raccoon river uh that is now put it on america's most endangered river list or, along with the mississippi which it feeds so it's all interconnected and you can all see it through the through the lens of storm lake and uh um uh, it's it's turned Storm Lake into a regional food processing center, uh, which has its advantages, uh, but it's completely changed the way the agricultural economy is structured. And I would submit that it's pretty much ruined our environment. You see both sides of it, and um, uh, it, it's certainly... Storm Lake has benefited in some ways, and it, in some ways it hasn't um, in terms of the income. And certainly the rest of Iowa has not has not been uh, has not benefited from the consolidation from all the ways that you were talking about. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing those those thoughts with us. And um, um, we're going to come back to you with some questions later on. OK. Um, all righty. So I now want to take a moment to, to thank our silver corporate, corporate sponsors. I want to mention them and, and tell them how much we appreciate the support of each and every one of them. And, and they are uh, Bob Ferguson Wellness, Centered Wealth, Everybody's Whole Foods, Frontline Print and Web, Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, Radiant Health Imaging, Soil Technologies Corporation, the Organic and Non-GMO Report of Ostu Partners, and the Southeast Iowa Sierra Club. I want to thank you all so much for your support. All right. Now I'm pleased to announce our next speaker, water quality expert, Dr. Chris Jones. Chris is a retired University of Iowa research engineer at IIHR Hydroscience and Engineering. For eight years, he managed a program of 70 water census throughout the state that provides real-time reporting of nitrate levels in our waterways. Chris's popular book, The Swine Republic, was based on his equally popular and respected University of Iowa blog, and it's garnering Chris and his work on addressing water quality issues a lot of attention in Iowa as well as in other states. He now has a new blog on Substack, where he continues to write engaging articles on the science and politics surrounding Iowa's poor water quality. Chris, thank you for being here tonight, and I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thanks, Diane, and I'll I thank Art for his comments, and I'll kind of build on that. And so um, I haven't lived my entire life in Iowa, but I've lived most of it here, and I grew up in Ankeny. My folks are from uh, Marion County, uh, Knoxville, Iowa, southeast of 
uh, Des Moines. And, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, small towns around Iowa look pretty uh, vibrant and pretty prosperous. And a lot of them don't anymore. And, you know, that's kind of a sad situation for a lot of us that um, grew up here. And so, you know, in the 1950s, we had 4,600 school districts in Iowa, and now we have 330. And so when we think about the consolidation in agriculture, that certainly has had cultural impacts across the state. And, you know, a lot of us might think those have not been very positive. And so likewise, in the livestock industry, um, we've seen a lot of consolidation as Art um, discussed there. And so in 1980, we had about 60,000 farmers uh, that were raising hogs and the average farmer that had hogs in 1980 had about 200. Now we have maybe 5,000 farmers raising hogs and the average number of hogs that they raise is up around 5,000. So we've gone from 200 to 5,000 on individual farms. And so uh, certainly this has provided some efficiencies for the packing industry, uh, as Art uh, talked about there, uniformity in the size, shape, and weight of the um, of the hogs. But um, what it's done is it's concentrated the waste into the hands of just a few of um, uh, just a few farmers. And so what we've done is we've made that waste what I call hot. We've made it hot. And so imagine a barnyard uh, back in 1980 with, you know, maybe 200 yard, 200 hogs, um, roaming around and um, defecating around the, the farm. And now that's not the way it is. The, the waste from the 5,000 hogs goes through um, a grate and is collected into a, a pit beneath the uh, hog barn along with the wash water and the urine and so forth. And so the volume uh, um, of the waste is enormous uh, that an individual hog farmer has to manage compared to back in 1980. And so this um, really presents some environmental challenges for Iowa, and it's really a colossal problem, not just for the farmers, but for the state and our regulatory agencies. And because so much of this hog waste now is composed of water, um, it's very heavy, uh, it's very expensive to haul it for any um, distance, Farmers can only haul it for about about eight miles at the maximum before it just doesn't pay anymore, and it just would pay to buy commercial fertilizer. And so, consequently, we get very large um, inputs of manure and nutrients um, to certain fields and certain areas of the state, and and we know in these livestock dense watersheds, um, that's where our worst water is. You know, there's no doubt that um, that's the case. And so we look at things like the Upper Raccoon, for example, as Art mentioned, uh, but also um, watersheds like the Floyd River, uh, the Rock River in northwest Iowa, um, North Maquoketa over here in eastern Iowa, which is more of a, a cattle um, thing. Um, we know these um, watersheds where there's really intense um, livestock production, those uh, places are where our worst water is. And so as we talk about water quality in Iowa, um, a lot of times, you know, we think that, geez, if farmers could just do things a little bit better, if we could just give them a few extra bucks here and there to put a, put a Band-Aid over here um, on this section and put a diaper over here on this other section and just manage things a little bit better, we'll get the environmental outcomes that we want. And I think um, it's been a real disservice to both farmers and to the people of Iowa to project that message out into the state, because what we really have here is a problem of scale. And that's not something that our leaders here in Iowa want to talk about. We just have so much. We have so much um, production here in terms of both crops and livestock. And can we ever get the environmental outcomes that we want when we're producing at this scale? And I would say no. 
even if we have all farmers doing everything perfectly, um, we're still going to get quite a large amount of pollution associated with our production systems because we know that they are leaky, what we call leaky. And so um, trying to dispose of the manure and then also apply commercial fertilizer um, and synchronize all that with when the crops need it is really impossible in a climate like Iowa's. And so we know that, um, you know, our crops are really only growing from say uh, mid-April to about the end of September, if, if that, maybe the end of August really. And so they're not using the nutrients very often. Um, and we know that um, to get rid of all this manure, we have to apply it in um, times in, in months outside of those when the crops are really using it. And so this leaves these new real, these nutrients really vulnerable to loss to the environment. And thus, you know, we have this pollution all over the state. We have 7,000 private wells that have been um, contaminated since the year 2000. We have hundreds of streams that are impaired. Uh, and so we really need to look at the production system and can we continue to produce at this scale? That's the discussion the state needs to have. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, scale. <laughs> That's definitely the, the issue here. And I don't know how we um, and we can maybe look at this in our questions, how we might be able to roll that back at some point, how we address that. Um, but thank you. Thank you for these, your, your comments tonight. Um, okay, I've got one more set of businesses and organizations I'd like to acknowledge. There are Broadens corporate sponsors, and I wanna thank all of them, um, which is Green Building Supply, Green Gourmet, Heartland Insurance Solutions of Southeast Iowa, How Is She Cares, and the Big Apple Orchard. Now, I want to say all our business corporate sponsors tonight recognize the importance and connection between a good quality of life and a strong rural economy. And our organization corporate sponsors work hard for a healthier, more sustainable Iowa. I want to thank everyone for participating in this year's corporate sponsorship program, and I encourage all of you to support them. Okay, now I'm happy to announce Chris Peterson, and uh, I've worked with Chris very closely on CAFO issues over the past 10 years. Chris is a great guy. Um, he's a lifelong independent traditional hog farmer in Clear Lake, Iowa. He raises Berkshire hogs on a small scale farm. And as an independent farmer, he's personally experienced the challenges and threat of livestock consolidation to his family farm. And he's seen how the fabric of rural Iowa has weakened. Chris is the past president of the Iowa Farmers Union, a co-founder of the Iowa Alliance for Responsible Agriculture and a member of many national groups He's featured in the upcoming documentary, Greener Pastures, and he's a fearless advocate for family farmers. Chris, welcome, and thank you for being here tonight. Yes, thank you, Diane, and thanks to all the speakers for being on, and thank you all for tuning in and listening to us tonight. Um, as always, I have a lot to say, so I'll try and condense it. Um, my first thought is the title of the meeting, Bigger is Not Better. And what what a time for us to be thinking this. Um, the evidence is in socially and economically, you know, bigger is not better. Now, I want to talk a little bit. I grew up in a teenager in the late 60s, early 70s. I want to talk about my little hometown. Uh, look it up on the map, Swaledale, Iowa. Uh, at one time, we had 400 people. Right now, we have 139. And this has all happened in my lifetime. Um, back then, we had a gas station. 
we had a bank branch, we had a grocery store, we had a hardware store, we had a post office. We had the junior high, uh, Rockwell Swaldo School District. I graduated in 74. My father-in-law graduated from Swaldo when it was a standalone independent district in the late 40s. Um, we had a grain elevator, a railroad, an implement dealership, two bars with restaurants, the best steaks around, uh, Fourth of July celebrations every year, bands, festivals, tractor pulls, uh, street dance, wall to wall people, you can even walk down Main Street. Um, it was rural and family farm culture at its best. That's all gone now, except the post office, and we had to fight to keep that. Um, moving on to a more personal uh, thought on the social impacts. Um, generations of cultural and social development of rural and family farms, a system built on family labor, built on knowledge passed down from generations to generations. Um, this is what I miss, you know, in my lifetime, what I've seen happen. Um, the steering wheel waves. Nobody waves at anybody anymore in the gravel roads. Um, respect it. Respect. Uh, respect for elders. Respect for the land. Admiration of the neighbors. Respect for the animals uh, and nature. It's basically gone. And the the days when everybody talked, everybody visited, there was closeness, support. Uh, when the neighbors were in need, they were helped. Um, independent family farms um, were a close-knit party. Um, There's card parties. There was potlucks. Uh, the kids, you know, I was one of them at one time. We had the keggers and everything else. Uh, there is a very cultural uh, closeness of rural. Um, it was a spiritual thing, you know. Not I'm not talking religious here. I'm talking spiritual, and that's basically all gone now. Um, division has taken over politics. Um, how everybody farms. Um, isolation and despair, um, hopelessness out here. Um, and then they wonder why rural people don't vote much, really? Give us a reason to. And, you know, this, this has happened over a generation. And um, Iowa nice, you know, they used to talk about Iowa nice. It's left. It's gone. Uh, I blame that on the outsiders and corporate agriculture with the help of politicians, a lot of them, big money. They've ruined our culture. They've ruined our family farms. Um, where does it end? And, you know, um, Diane mentioned uh, greener pastures. We're going to be showing it, and I'm going to be speaking at the Iowa Farmers Union Convention, actually in Storm Lake Art, uh, December 1st. And uh, we'll be showing that. Uh, and I'm quite angry most of the nonprofits won't touch and ignore the mental and, and social impacts and the suicides which is four percentage greater out here in, in rural and in the family farm culture uh so um you know please keep that in mind uh and there's even some fallout in the pet world okay i got three little rat terrier dogs and uh, house dogs and my dad brought home bought me a dog when I was like four or five years old. Wow, that's cool, you know. 
And about four or five weeks later, I figured out why it was a rat terrier. We shelled corn and killed every rat that ran out of the corn crib. Um, so I, you know, and it used to be the most popular breed in America. And there's hardly any of them around now. And for you cat people, uh, this is about 15 years ago, I was speaking in South Dakota and a CAFO meeting. And I had one old boy stand up and he says, you know, we've lost so many neighbors and it's getting so bad out here. It's getting too far for the Tomcats to travel anymore. So anyway, um, that's it for now. Thank you much. Okay, thank you, Chris. Yeah, you've seen you 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 came from a an environment where uh, kind of like pre consolidation, and you've really seen on a personal level, on a farming level, the change. And it's it must be difficult to to see that that decline that that you've been able that you've experienced. And I'm sorry that you and others have had to experience that. You know, it's not, not great, but thank you for sharing, you know, yep. all of that with us. Thank you. Okay. Have one more speaker, which I'm very happy to introduce. It's Sonia Trom Ayers. She's a family farmer, a rural advocate, and a family law attorney from Minnesota. We've been focusing on Iowa so far tonight, but the problems of consolidation reach far beyond our border. And Sonia is here to tell us what it's like for her in Minnesota, which actually ranks number two in the country uh, right after Iowa in pork production. Now, Sonia got her, with, first got involved in rural advocacy 30 years ago when the first CAFO came to her community, and she's been fighting factory farms ever since. She's surrounded by 12 hawk confinements within three miles of her farm. So she knows only too well the impacts of these factory farms. Sonia, her family and other local citizens founded Dodge County Concerned Citizens, which is a grassroots group like JFAN fighting corporate factory farms. And she's worked and written extensively on the threats that livestock consolidation poses. Sonia, welcome. And thank you for being with us here tonight. Thanks, Diane. It's a pleasure being here. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I assume is uh, uploaded. There we go. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, our story begins in 1892. My great grandfather, Ed Trom, immigrated to the United States from Norway with his two cousins and my great grandfather is on the far right. He settled in Dodge County, just 30 miles or so from the state of Iowa. So uh, we're just across the border. Next. My great grandfather, like others who emigrated were busy trying to build communities. And in 1917, uh, he served as the chief architect of Little Westfield Lutheran Church. And that church stands on the same mile square as our family farm. My mother led efforts to restore the church, uh, which periodically holds church services today. Next. Here's a photo that was taken in about 1932. My grandparents moved on to our farm in 1925. So we're soon coming up on 100 years. Uh, this is where my grandparents raised their 10 children, including my father, who is at the far right. He's just a little boy. He's there at our farm with his two sisters. Next. Here's a photo of our farm today. You can see the corn on either side of the driveway, um, and you can see the building spot ahead. I am actively involved in the day-to-day -day operation of our farm. And there's something very special about being able to walk the same land as my grandparents, my parents, and other uh, family members. There's just something very special about that. Next. 
But after the 1980s uh, farm crisis, we noticed fundamental change was occurring in rural America. And some of the early signs of consolidation were the first swine CAFOs that were constructed just one mile north of our farm. Here are two buildings. Uh, one was constructed in 1993, the second in 1998. These buildings together hold about 4,000 hogs. The 1990s were also a tumultuous time uh, for independent farmers like Chris Peterson and my brother-in-law Dave and my sister Shelly. Uh, Dave and Shelly farm just outside of our hometown of Blooming Prairie, just a few miles from Austin, Minnesota, which is home to Hormel Corporation. And the industry pulled a power play. And so Dave, like Chris Peterson, was an independent farmer. Dave would deliver his hogs to market at, at Hormel. And this was the time period when some of the factory farms were coming into the area and Dave and other independents had to wait and wait to deliver their hogs because they were rushing through hogs that were coming in in great big semis from some of the area factory farms. And essentially, Dave and other independents were denied access to the marketplace. Next. Uh, and by the way, Dave and Shelley uh, made the painful decision in 1998 to leave farming altogether. And they joined a lost generation of independent family farmers. And we lost from the period 2005 to 2018, approximately 180,000 independent farmers from the land. In 2013, my parents, or I'm sorry, in 2013, my mother went into the nursing home. My mother suffered from advanced Parkinson's. And just a few months later, my dad received a notice that there was yet another swine factory farm going in. This one, just one half mile west of our farm. And so at that point, my parents, my father was determined. He said, enough is enough. And my elderly parents initiated the first of three separate lawsuits against Dodge County officials and neighboring swine factory farm operators. We now have 12 swine factory farms within a three mile radius of our farm, including this one just a half mile west. And you'll notice there's no family and there's no farm. Next. I was determined at that point, and I decided I was gonna jump in with both feet uh, to understand what on earth was going on in rural America. And I discovered that it's a pyramid scheme with multinational corporations at the top of the pyramid, integrators in the middle who own the, the sows and the baby pigs and the feeder pigs that roll through the system. And the integrators also provide feed and veterinary services to contract growers at the bottom of the pyramid. And those contract growers, we used to call them farmers, but they're, they're called contract growers today. This is a very secretive arrangement. Those contract growers do not own one hog that rolls through the factory farm situated on their farms. And it's very secretive. And this industry has essentially created what I call a community within a community. Next. Consolidation has, as Chris has mentioned, has created uh, tremendous divisiveness in rural America. My family has been on the front lines for years fighting industrial agriculture. We have faced tremendous harassment and intimidation. That's the result of consolidation. And I have personally had to contact the Sheriff's Department at least a dozen times for assistance. 
we just a few hours after my brother and I were pulling weeds out of the bean field, the stop sign just a few feet away was sprayed with bullet holes. Uh, there were late night phone calls to my dad who was in his late 80s. Lowell, have you changed yet? Also, the industry, someone within the industry placed blue farm booties from the neighboring swine factory farm to our to the end of our driveway. Just a reminder that the industry is large and in charge. They've also thrown constant garbage into our road ditches and our driveway and so forth. And there are other tactics that have happened. They also file false police reports with the sheriff's department, not to report some violation, but to have the deputy show up and put heat on me so that I'll shut up. I included a statement that we went to the press, not to grab headlines, but for our own safety. Now, isn't that a tragic statement? But what's happening to my family is consistent with what's happening to other frontline families. People are afraid. They're afraid to speak out. Their jobs are threatened. Businesses are threatened. Next. I'm a family law attorney in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I've practiced for nearly 35 years as a family law attorney, divorces, custody, and I also see a, not, a lot of domestic abuse. And I'm trained in power and control dynamics. And one of the things that I quickly realized is that the same power and control dynamics that are present in unhealthy marriages are also present in rural America, we have a power imbalance in rural America, and it's quite serious. Next. I also included this evening the power and control wheel and the same coercive control tactics that I see in these very unhealthy marriages are also present in rural America using economic abuse, coercion tactics, intimidation, environmental, emotional abuse. These are all the same tactics. These are all the same dynamics that I see in unhappy marriages. Next. Rural America is suffering. The brokenness of our food system is evident in the suffering of rural communities and, it, and has left a trail of broken relationships. I wanna leave you with one final comment, and that is that consolidation has caused considerable heartache in America's heartland. Thanks, Diane. Thank you, Sonia. Um, you brought a, a an different and interesting perspective to um, addressing this in terms of the dynamics as a family lawyer, um, you know, seeing a certain a certain package of dynamics that are not often talked about with regards to, you know, these the CAFOs coming into communities. And I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you for uh, your remarks tonight and, and sharing your experiences with, with all of us tonight. Um, we've got one more speaker uh, here with us tonight, um, and that's one of JFAN's board members, Dean Drasnan. Dean is the owner of Dean Drasnan Communications, a national PR firm based in Fairfield, Iowa. Dean's gonna take just a couple of minutes to speak on why JFAN needs continued community support. Hi, Dean. Thank you, Diane. And I wanna start by thanking our panel. Um, you know, what you guys have just given us is a vision of what we're up against. It's very, very concrete. And the interesting thing that I take away this time is that when we think of CAFOs and consolidation, we're really often thinking of the physical aspect of the destruction of a style of living, a, a long legacy of, of 
of farms, family farms. But really what everybody's been talking about is, as is, is, uh, Chris, Chris put it, that the soul of farming has been lost. The spiritual aspect of farming has been lost. And that's as deep as it gets. Consolidation, consolidation that we're facing does not happen by accident. It's meticulously, surreptitiously planned by the CAFO industrial complex. And we need to consolidate our own assets to meet the challenges of this behemoth. So now, I say this every time, but I'm, I really mean it. <laughs> now is the time to act definitively with your generous support for JFAN and our executive director, the brilliant and tireless Diane Rosenberg. And here is where everybody should, would, would applaud if we were together in a group, but you can applaud on your own. Make no mistake, without JFAN, we would suffer the same fate as the other counties in Iowa. And if you've driven through the towns nearby, Keokuk, Washington, driving towards Iowa City, you've smelled what their quality of life has become. And I hate to use the word, this is the word that, that Art used, <laughs> but it's putrid. There's no other way to, to share the truth, state the truth. They have seven times the number of CAFOs that we do. And it's no coincidence that other counties have been overrun by CAFOs and we have not. They waited too long thinking it over. And then it was too late and their quality of life was gone. While they were thinking about it, we very fortunately had a vital and aggressive JFAN advocating for our safety and well being. Financial support is not abstract. It's a commitment to action, to energy, the daily vigilance that's required to discourage encroaching unwanted CAFOs from setting up in our backyard. Please donate today, generously, for yourself, your family, and for the future of our extraordinary town. Thank you in advance for your generosity. And the, the website to go to is jfaniowa.org, jfaniowa.org. We are a grassroots funded organization and rely entirely on your generosity to work on behalf of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And, um... And I, I just want to say I, I appreciate Dean's comments and uh, the donations that come to JFAN go toward protecting Jefferson County and they go toward protecting Iowa. Um, and uh, we're all very devoted and and passionate in, in trying to, to do that. So any support you can provide is very much appreciated at jfaniowa.org. You just hit the Donate Now button. And, um, and you can make a donation that way. So thank you. Um, okay, so now we're gonna turn this over to our all our panelists, all our speakers tonight. We're gonna dive into your questions. We've got a lot of questions here. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, and so let me see, let's get everyone on, on the screen. I'm just waiting for art. Yeah, the, it won't let me. It says the host won't let me. Oh, well, let's let's change that. There you are. Okay. All right. Good. So, um, let me just start at the top. I'll go through as, again as many as I can. So, Art, at the beginning when you were talking, you had some statistics regarding median income, childhood health, et cetera, um, with regards to 
um, Storm Lake, uh, and we have uh, someone that was asking if you could repeat those statistics, please. Okay. Uh, Storm Lake's median income is $51,000, median household income. Iowa's median household income is about $80,000. Minnesota's is $96,000, and Illinois' is $95,000. And uh, the other things I was talking about was that Iowa has is the only state with a growing uh, cancer rate. Uh, and it's number two in the incidence of cancer. And it's number one in childhood respiratory illnesses. And there's been a lot of research lately showing that that that's related that children who live in the vicinity of meatpacking complexes have higher asthmatic rates than other children. Um, and uh, so anyway, those are those I think that covers the statistics they were asking about. Okay, thank you, Art. And Sonia, I'm I'm curious, uh, in terms of Minnesota, do you have any uh any study statistics on like some of the, the health um you know concerns that are the asthma and cancer and, and like that. Do you know where Minnesota might fall on that in those areas? Uh I don't have that data, the data points in front of me, but um I but I will tell you on the so I grew up on the south end of Dodge County. The north end of Dodge County is um karst topography and um actually there was a seminal action here just a few days ago by the epa came in and they issued a letter to three of our state agencies the minnesota pollution control agency the minnesota department of health and also the minnesota department of ag and said you need to get your nitrates under control uh, because we've got high nitrates and we've got a high incidence of cancer and nitrate, you know, we, we can show it and we've got, and so that data is out there. And so I'm thankful that we finally have the EPA coming in and I'm hopeful that we're going to see a watershed moment here where it's not just the karst region, but other areas where the EPA comes in and says, get it under control or we're going to do it for you. Chris Jones, do you think that we would see something like that in Iowa? Well, I would sure hope so. And so we see in Minnesota, it was the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy that sort of led the, the petition there, uh, petitioned EPA to do something about this. And so um, do we have a group in Iowa that, you know, has the courage to sort of follow suit? so to speak, uh, with the Minnesota folks, and we would sure hope so. And so we have 7,000 private wells here in Iowa that have been contaminated with nitrate over 10 milligrams per liter. And it's not just in the karst area of Northeast Iowa, it's also um, a fair number of wells in Western Iowa. And so, again, we know that there's very, very likely been some health consequences for people drinking this water and you know, um, it's really good that we've seen a number of stories in the media about this. Um, we've seen the Flatwater Press in Nebraska talk about uh, cancers and other health effects, um, especially in children in Nebraska from drinking high nitrate water. Um, we've seen the Circle of Blue uh, uh, with the Toxic Terrain series, Keith Schneider writing about this in Minnesota and Dodge County, as a matter of fact, where um, Sonia is. Uh, about the health uh, consequences of this. And so, I mean, there are human impacts to what we're doing here on the landscape. There can be no doubt. Chris Peterson, um, just following up with that, in your area of, of Clear Lake, what are the wells like for people there? Because I'm gonna assume many of the people are on private wells um, or you know, even the municipal what is it they have? Do you have a, a nitrate problem there, like so many of the different pockets that we have in in the state? And you need to un unmute. 
Yeah, we have some nitro problems due to farming practices, you know. Um, far as the animal agriculture, industrial ag, the community has banded together three times over the last 20 years. And Clear Lake's a tourist town, Miss City, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, the music man. Uh, pretty, pretty historical area, okay? And the community has banded together three times. Uh, in our neighborhood, we had a fight over corporate hogs in 2001. Uh, they built three 24.99 compliments. Uh, we raised enough hell and then such heartburn that they left the area. And about a year later, Sparbo Eggs tried to put two and a half, three and a half million laying in six miles south of Clear Lake, which was three miles west of our farm. And the whole community come together, the city councils, the economic development, the chambers of commerce, uh, the family farmers, we all come together and, uh, you know, put the heat on the politicians and everything else. And Lord and behold, we woke up one morning. And keep in mind, Sparbo Eggs already had the land bought. It was beside the largest wetland in the state of Iowa, Union Hills. Uh, woke up one morning, big announcement, they're leaving town. We won. Uh, in 2018, I think it was, uh, we were informed by the setting governor at that time and uh, a packing plant uh, was going to locate in Mesa City, Iowa, uh, 18,000 daily kill. And again, the community come together. We seen the handwriting on the wall. Uh, the CAFOs were going to move in. The whole town was going to stink. Um, you know, all the all the impacts of a big, nasty industry like this. Um, the community come together again, and they left. So we have quite the history around here of imposing industrial ag, and we have one three of three. So our well problems and this and that, um, aren't that bad. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We have a question here um, for everyone. Um, I've been perpetually concerned about the disproportionate influence of the Farm Bureau. Can any of the speakers comment on how or why the Farm Bureau, supposedly farmer advocates, has been captured by corporate ag interests? And how might we influence the Farm Bureau to become advocates for family farms? Yeah. Who would like to go with that one? Who'd like to start well, with that? Yeah, I, I'll be real short and brief. Uh, I was a Farm Bureau member for a lot of years. Uh, I resigned uh, in 2099 or year 2000. I've done the six, help do the 60 minutes piece about Farm Bureau that they are truly not the voice of the family farm. Uh, it's basically a big insurance company. And, you know, they're, they're one of the primary causes of what's happened to rural America. They're in the top 10 lobbying groups in Washington, D.C. Uh, they could have prevented all this or slowed it down or whatever. And over the years, um, there's three things I despise, and that's industrial corporate ag, most politicians, and, of course, Farm Bureau for letting this all happen to our culture and our state and our people. Art, as a journalist, how would you, how would you approach that question? Oh, I have almost nothing to add to what Chris said other than uh, I have my own experiences with the Farm Bureau from the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit. And uh, it doesn't distinguish Farm Bureau in any way, but it became clear that they'll do anything um, to protect 
the agrochemical franchise in Iowa, uh, uh, whether you're talking about the fertilizer industry or the livestock industry, or they'll go to any lengths. And look what they did to Bill Stowe, the former uh, CEO of the Des Moines Water Works, uh, how they slandered him with 400, a $400,000 advertising campaign. And uh, they'll, they'll stop at nothing, which is why I should probably shut up. <laughs> Sonia in Minnesota. How, I mean, Iowa Farm Bureau is very powerful. Um, what is it like in Minnesota? It's uh, the same thing here. This is just Iowa North, <laughs> especially the southern part of the state. And uh, Farm Bureau has been instrumental in bringing these factory farms into the area. They use their membership um, to, to, you know, to build this, to build the foundation. So it was no surprise to us when the first factory farm that went up in the area, just a mile north of our farm, it was the son of a um, son of a Farm Bureau member. And so every time. Every time I see one of these fights, and I've participated in these fights in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, other jurisdictions, first question I ask is, what's the Farm Bureau connection? <laughs> Boom. That's your answer. Yeah. And, and Chris Jones, from your experiences, um, you know, can you comment on on farm bureau and well water yeah, and legislature and everything you know i think there's um you know we forget that 60 minutes did a, a bit on farm bureau what, about 20 years ago now and basically showed what the score was that it's a financial company that's heavily invested in these big agribusiness giants and so you know that's the the motivation here uh, I think behind a lot of what they do. And so, um, you know, as Art has written about many times, you know, we need to sell chemical, we need to sell uh, fertilizer, we need to sell machinery, we need to sell insurance, we need to sell this, that, and the other thing on all this land. And so that's what Farm Bureau is concerned about is, you know, moving product across all these acres in Iowa because they're invested in all these people that, and all these companies that move the product. And so that's um, what their um, real story is. And, you know, they're an advocacy organization also, and in, in addition to a financial organization. And, you know, I work for an advocacy organization and job one, when you work for a place like that is to make, your members feel like the world would end were it not for you. Right. And so that's what they do very well. And so they uh, talk to people, well, Oh my God, if, if it wasn't for us, everything you do would be re regulated from the time you get up in the morning until the time you go to bed at night. And so I think they've been able to keep, you know, a pretty uh, fair, percentage of the farmers sort of in the corral with them because of that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Here's a question. Um, what can those who are concerned about nitrates in the water say to farmers who are afraid that monitoring of nitrate output will destroy farming, whether that is actually true or not? Like to take well, that. I think, you know, the the existing production system could not exist if farmers didn't have, uh, if the system didn't have license to uh, release nitrate to the environment. I mean, we could not grow corn and soybeans here the way we do if we regulated um, nitrate discharge. We just couldn't do it. Um, if farmers could do everything perfectly, um, we're still going to get nitrate pollution. And so um, what really what we need, you know, are more diverse farming systems, um, you know, that'll sort of uh, prevent this sort of leakage, right? And so we, although certainly there's things that individual farmers can do to reduce 
the loss of nitrogen and other chemicals from their land, we really need an alternative sort of production system. And that's what we need to be talking about. And that's what um, people uh, in leadership positions in agribusiness and politics won't let us talk about. What would you all see as an alternative production system? That, that you know, I think the goal ultimately is to move toward um, away from industrial agriculture, but it doesn't happen like overnight. You know, it, it, there's a got to move toward it. So what would you see right now as an alternative that could potentially mitigate a number of the problems that the, the wide ranging problems that are all being experienced right now? What would you, Art, what would you, what would you say to that? Um, there is no sustainable answer to the problem uh, currently. Uh, they're building high-rise hog hotels in China uh, to keep up with the demand for protein. And people in Asia have rising expectations, as well they might, uh, for more protein consumption. And if you look at the charts of world meat, production i mean they've just gone through the roof and since 1980 as living standards increase people want to increase their protein intake when you look at the destruction of the amazon rainforest it's all related to soybeans and poultry and pork production and to to get more protein into asia beyond introducing cultivated meat that is meat grown in a lab real meat grown in the lab i don't know what the answer is because i don't know uh you know i mean smithfield owns half the hogs in iowa that's the chinese and a bunch of the others are owned by the brazilians who are owned by the chinese and i just don't know how you unravel the web and without some sort of huge innovation like cultivated meat but if we all raised hogs like Chris Peterson, I'm not sure that you could feed that Asian demand. Uh, and uh, I don't know what the answer is. But well, this, admit, this is not sustainable, what we're doing. We cannot, we cannot raise hogs in a 26-story Chinese building, and we can't burn down the rainforest. And we can't com continue to shit into the Gulf of Mexico. So I would say, you know, a start would be to make the industry responsible for their pollution. <clears throat> That's step one. And, you know, until we do that, I do think, you know, it, it's sort of futile. But once we make the industry responsible for the pollution, then we get the players uh, making different decisions. And so would you put a 5,000 uh, head hog barn in, you know, this spot, you know, pick it out, pick wherever you want in some watershed. Would you put a 12,000 head cattle feedlot up at the headwaters of a trout stream of Bloody Run if we regulated the pollution robustly from that operation? You probably would not do that, right? You would make different decisions. And so the first thing we have to do is effectively regulate the pollution from these operations. <clears throat> I think, you know, these alternative production systems, look at what we've done. We've, we've created a guaranteed market for corn. How have we done that? Through the renewable fuel standard. And so, you know, 55% or even higher sometimes of our corn goes to produce ethanol. We have to get rid of ethanol. And so for me, that is, you know, step one and step 1A is make uh, the industry responsible for their pollution. Makes a lot of sense. We have a question um, here. Oh, can, yes. I, can I yeah. comment just briefly about, I mean, yes. the problem yes. is yes. that we have, we have offloaded the responsibility for waste management to the contract growers at the bottom of that pyramid scheme. And the multinationals just wash their hands of it. And, you know, and these hog contract growers are told, 
that man, the manure is valuable. You know, that's, and so, you know, my, my dad used to say, you know, he says, I don't call them pork producers. He says, I call them shit producers. So, you know, pardon me, but I mean, that's the way it is. And a number of these farmers are putting up CAFOs because they don't care about raising hogs or animal welfare. They're putting up these CAFOs because they don't want to have to buy uh, synthetic fertilizer. They want to be able to spread manure. And so, you know, that's the incentive. And so somehow we have to disincentivize these farmers. Um, the other point I would make is this, you know, I've opened up a line of discussion with more than one contract grower and these contract growers um, don't believe for a minute that they're all fond of this, of what's happening. And uh, one of the contract growers told me that he has not had a contract increase since 2000. Imagine 23 years, he's never received an increase. And they keep signing the contracts. Well, I think the problem is they can't get out. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> once you're caught in the system, you can't get out because usually they'll tie the financing to used to be like a 10 year term. It was based on the financing. Now those terms are 11, 12 years, perhaps longer. And um, the financing is a whole nother piece of this, but um what happens at the end of that contract term, they're said they're told you're not going to make much money during the contract term, but at the end of that contract term, they're supposed to be paid off and then they're finally going to make a, a living wage. They don't because the problem is these buildings have, uh, there's water running in these buildings all the time. Equipment has to be replaced. These farmers are in debt and they're never, these contract growers, they're never going to get out. They can't get out of the system. So, it's a, it's a rigged system and they can't get out. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. I think it's important to say that some farmers like it. I mean, I know that's the case. There's some farmers in Iowa, especially young guys that want to get in. I mean, this is how they get in if they want to farm. And so the price of land is so high and it's, um, really difficult to break into farming for a young person. So for a young a guy, you know, raising hogs on contract is a way to get your foot in the door. And so, you know, the truth is a lot of them like it. I mean, I know that it's a ball and chain for some, but there's others that do want to go along with it. Yeah. And as a farmer, um, a lot of years full time land and hogs. Um, you know, I called them the snake oil salesmen, and that was the fertilizer and and uh, chemical dealers stopping at the farm trying to get you to buy their product and more of it. And you know, you got to have some common sense. You can't just base your decisions on bushels. And while well, you can get four or five more bushels corn an acre, or if you put on this much more nitrogen, or if you buy this for a life or whatever, well, I'll sit down with that thing called a pencil and figure it out. Um, you know, it, it it's a wash, okay? So why pollute the environment to get the extra four or five bushels of corn or whatever? The same way for raising pigs and yeah, I do it the old fashioned way. I do Berkshires. Um, yeah, I get double money for them because it's sustainable, no antibiotics, and uh, the top of the meat, as far as pork goes. And so I do things a little differently, and that's how I survived all these years. Um, and Instead of using all the chemicals, I did use chemicals when I was grain farming. But here's the deal. The best weed control on the planet is iron. It's called cultivating corn. You know, you can get 12-row cultivators or whatever. And I did that, and I banded what chemicals I decided to use 
over the rows only. And certain chemicals, I was experimenting, cutting down the half rates. And you know, the only difference was the weeds died a little slower. And I love to see a slow death for weeds as a farmer. So there's things like that you can do to, you know, it makes a different footprint on the plant, on the soil, on the neighborhood, on your product, whatever. I don't like big business getting in my pocket for unnecessary purposes. Thank you. A question here, what role has federal government played in the consolidation of agriculture? Who would like to start with that? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the federal farm program has played a huge role in the industrialization of agriculture. I mean, you know, we have what, five program crops, corn, wheat, rice, mm -hmm. Uh, cotton, and I'm forgetting one, sugar. And, uh, you know, those have been selected as in, in, those are industrial crops, really. And the reason for subsidizing corn uh, is to subsidize meat prices. And because, you know, the only real use for number two yellow corn is to feed hogs and cattle and poultry. And so it's really subsidizing uh, the meat industry as well. Although livestock producers have often complained that they're cut out of the program, so they deserve some sort of benefit on their own, uh, you know, like grazing CRP acres or whatever. And, and in fact, they're getting subsidized already through subsidized corn prices. And so it's had a huge impact on the industrialization of agriculture and however well intentioned it may have been, uh, you know, uh, the results are pretty obvious that we have half as many farmers today as we did when Chris and I graduated from high school. Anyone else on that? What do you want me? I have another question. Well, the federal farm programs used to pay out the most in bad years and the least in good years, and that's not the way it is anymore. And so, um, with the um, main um, uh, subsidy program now as uh, being crop uh, taxpayer subsidized crop insurance. Um, now, you know, the more acres you farm, the more money you get from the government. And so um, our federal farm programs certainly have created perversion um, in farming and have um, sort of uh, hastened consolidation, especially in crop farming. And I mean, it's really no secret now, you know, the federal farm programs pay out just as much in the good years as they do in the bad years. And when you get that situation, it's going to hasten along um, consolidation. Yeah. Um, the government, not only this government, but many governments in the world and past governments, um, you know, the way to stay in business is if you're a government is, have a cheap food policy. And, you know, in their mind, biggest better. Um, and at the end of the day, they take control from those nasty independent farmers and corporatize it. Uh, you know, so big is better. And as far as crop insurance, you know, back in the days when I was grain farming, you had ale insurance, whatever. You, you couldn't, there wasn't such a thing as having insurance to buy your income, okay, your guaranteed return. And uh, let me say one of the biggest uh, policy writers is Farm Bureau. And keep in mind, um, 
power out of every policy rule Farm Bureau gets 10% off the top. So we're, we're dealing with the liars here, big money. I have another question. Would anyone like to talk about community rights and local control? Well, I'll start as co-founder with Diana Dyer Alliance for Responsible Agriculture. Uh, our main objective has been over the years is to implement a statewide temporary building moratorium on factory farms until we start to figure this mess out and what's going on and how to regulate it, how to change things uh, going down that road. Um, local control, uh, you know, we've tried over the years uh, through the health ordinances, whatever. My county, Saragota County, after Worth County, was the second county in Iowa. I think it was 2002, thereabouts, to implement a county health ordinance um, on CAFOs. And that was a form of local control. and. I think at one time we had 14, 15 counties uh, who had uh, signed up to do that. And then the big Goliath stepped in again. Farm Bureau hauled us into the Iowa Supreme Court and beat us on it. So every time we've tried, uh, the industry representatives have stopped us. But we have standing legislation in the Iowa State House every year for uh, a moratorium, and it keeps gaining every year. So we ever have a change of political, the political landscape and leadership in the state, we'll get somewhere. So get out and vote, people. Pass it on. Well, I would submit that we don't need a moratorium. Um, if we know, uh, you know, the work we've done here uh, when I was working shows that, you know, farmers that um, have CAFOs apply way more nutrients than what the crops need. We know that. And so if we had a law that just restricted manure application in ways uh, that aligned it with the agronomic needs of the crops, all of a sudden, you restrict expansion of the industry, okay? And so if you make them apply the amount of manure nutrients that, that you know is aligned with the crop needs, then all of a sudden, you need more land to distribute the manure, and you have to haul it a longer distance. And so I'm not against a moratorium, but I would tell you, if we would just have some effective regulation of manure application, we could restrict expansion of the industry. There is no doubt. <clears throat> Sonia, up in Minnesota, uh, Iowa lost local control in 1995 um, with the state legislature. Up in Minnesota, do you have, do county supervisors have the ability to um, exercise some local control in terms of where a CAFO can be built or not? Yes, in Minnesota, we have what's called a delegated, we have delegated counties and the MPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has delegated authority to local units of government, the local counties, to um, for permitting, enforcement, oversight, and so forth. But in Dodge County, for example, Dodge County has never, ever denied a permit <laughs> for, for a CAFO. And so we have a very serious problem in Dodge County. Um, but the other piece of that is that our farm, for example, we're on a township road. And on the south side of the road is Westfield Township. And on the, the north side of the road is Ripley Township. 
And what's interesting is that Ripley Township adopted local planning and zoning at the local level because you can adopt local planning and zoning that's more restrictive. So you could limit, for example, um, uh, the size of a CAFO and the size of a the feedlot, right? So that, and you could also require that you have a fa you know a family. You can't just put up a building in the middle of a farm field, and so you can put those restrictions in place at the township level. And so, but the difference between Ripley and Westfield is almost night and day because there are very few CAFOs in Ripley Township and then Westfield Township, it's just, it's just off the hook in terms of the number of uh, swine CAFOs. Mm -hmm. So right now, but and by the way, in the state of North Dakota, uh, Farm Bureau, like they are working behind the scenes and they are working diligently to change the corporate law, the anti, you know, the corporate law there and to allow construction of CAFOs there, you know, North Dakota is going to become the next Iowa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are, what, are, what are your thoughts about community rights and local control? Well, we don't have local control in Iowa, so it's kind of a, a interesting discussion, I guess, but it's kind of moot. There is no local control in Iowa. Yeah. And frankly, there are no community rights. <laughs> That's that's a nice concept, but there are none. And the Iowa Supreme Court, federal district court, have re ruled repeatedly that we that agriculture has any, any right, any, every right to pollute any way it wants to. Uh, in the interest of public health, actually, the Iowa Supreme Court said that they can pollute under the 1918 drainage law in the interest of public health. So anyway, it's, it's, there are no, there is no local control and there is no protection under Iowa law against pollution. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's getting late. Uh, I have one more question for everyone. We have so many questions. I wish I could, uh, ask every one of them, but um, I'm gonna end with this one question here. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot tonight about all the issues around livestock consolidation. And I think we can all acknowledge that this is a really difficult issue to go up against. But being the eternal optimist, I, I do feel that change always begins with small steps and with persistence and time and sometimes a lot of time, we can work to eventually achieve our goals. And I like to hearken back to the abolitionist and suffragette movements. Um, they sure didn't have success overnight. They started small, but they also were going up against some very powerful and formidable forces, and they eventually prevailed. Uh, and I personally believe that if people work together to go up against the equally powerful forces of big egg and big food, this unsustainable system can eventually change. Like I said, it won't happen overnight, but it also won't happen unless we take action. We are all the key. So what I'd like to do is leave our participants with some ideas for action steps that they could take now to nurture this change and, and so I wanted to ask each one of you, uh, what types of action steps would you recommend from your perspectives on this issue? Who would like to start with that? I'll just say subscribe to your local newspaper. Uh, first of all, get up on the facts. And... Uh, subscribe to your local newspaper and find... And realize what's going on around you you might figure out where that smell's coming from well i would say to people it's not hopeless it's not hopeless and so when you look at the vast 
when you poll Iowans about this stuff, I mean, Iowans want clean water. They want parks. They want a cleaner environment. The majorities want that. So it's not hopeless. Um, so what do you do? Well, you know, we need overwhelming public opinion. And so I don't, as I've written, if you read what I write, I don't have a lot of faith in Democrats to address this. And so, I mean, having 65, 70% isn't going to do it. We need like 90% public opinion to change things. So where do you start? The legislature's a non-starter here right now. We know that. Um, and so what? when I get asked this question, I tell people, look, the county supervisors. Uh, yeah, we don't have local control, but the county supervisors can ask Iowa DNR, the director of I Iowa DNR, to um, decline these construction permits. Well, how often does that ever happen? It doesn't happen very often that the county supervisors do that. And so people need to agitate at the local and county level for what they want in terms of environment until the legislature is ready uh, for change. And so, uh, again, talk to your county supervisors, tell them what you want, tell them the change that you want and that you expect them to act. I actually have similar comments, Chris, and that is, you know, it's been real, it's just been inspirational to be part of this uh, discussion this evening and to have so many participants and it's clear that we need to breathe new life into these rural communities. And, but folks who are on the front lines, folks in these small communities, you have access. You have access to the room. You have access to your communities. You have access to, make, to bring change to your local community. And, and that means voting with your fork. It also means getting out and uh, voting in the, you know, in public and getting people who are, you know, this is about your value system and what's important to you. And I'm going to leave you with one word. And this is a word that I give to all of my clients because I get clients who are, you know, like this, they can't raise their heads up. They're, they're suffering. They're going through a divorce. It's the worst time in their lives. But the same, I'm going to give you the same word I give to all my clients. And that word is hope. You have to maintain hope. Chris, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, as everybody knows over the years, um, I bleed rural and family farm. It goes back all the way to my grandparents in Denmark and Ireland who were a family of farmers. And I'm unbiased. So um, small steps. Okay, what can we do? Uh, change always starts with people speaking up. Small groups. Uh, small bunches of people. We need to preach our hearts out. You know, the political process until we get enough people waking up. So we need to talk to those consumers again and again and again. We need to educate. They are our best friends. If we're going to save and rebuild what's left of the family farm system, it's going to have to fall on the backs of the consumers. And another small step, buy local, buy sustainable. Organic really doesn't mean that much anymore. They've broken down the standards and this and that. And so two words, local and sustainable. And food needs to become, through whatever means, a priority and a way of a lot of the people that vote. Um, I hope that works out going into the future. And remind all these politicians, by gosh, they're supposed to work for us. That's why we elected them. Most of them seem not to be doing that. So let's remind them to work for us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Um, well, thank you for all these different action steps. They're really good recommendations. And I really want to encourage everyone to do whatever you can, big or small, so to foster this positive change toward a healthy agricultural system, because what we have now is not benefiting too many people. It benefits some people and it benefits the multinational corporations. So I wish we could answer more questions. Um, we have so many questions tonight. I wanna to thank everybody um, for participating in this, in this program. I really wanna thank Art Collin, Dr. Chris Jones, Chris Peterson, and Sonia Ayers for joining us tonight, for sharing their ideas and perspectives during this incredibly interesting and informative meeting. Um, I like to end on Sonia's um, word of hope because I think that's what we all have to hold on to as we can work toward something that we really want to see in our agricultural system. I want to thank everyone who's here who joined us tonight. We had a great turnout. We had over 200 people on, on this, at this meeting. Um, we've recorded the meeting. We're going to be posting it on the JFAN YouTube channel in the coming days. We'll send out the link to the recording. I encourage you to share it with your family and friends. Um, I'm going to start uh, just a two-minute slideshow now. If you'd like to stick around for a couple more minutes to enjoy some photos, some, some music, and another acknowledgement of our corporate sponsors. Um, again, I want to thank all our speakers. I want to thank all of you who came tonight and um, one, all the wonderful questions you gave us. And I want to just tell you, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.